Hello and welcome to the Rogers Brief. I'm Adam Rogers. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. The Mass Casualty Commission proceedings are on hold until next Monday, um, April 11th. But I wanted to do another video uh, this week just to talk about the documents that are now available on the Mass Casualty Commission website. This issue came up uh, last week in uh, the, I guess I'll call it the Heather O'Brien controversy where some documents were referenced in the foundational documents, some source documents that is, but they weren't available for uh, review. And I know many people are now looking to the Mass Casualty Commission website and those source documents and doing some of their own investigating. So I thought it would be helpful to just talk about how a lawyer would typically approach those kind of documents. The documents that we're seeing are similar to what you would get in a criminal trial. Of course, there's a much greater volume of them here in uh, an inquiry setting. So just to uh, talk about how a lawyer would approach these uh, documents uh, is going to be the topic of the video today. Now, when the Heather O'Brien situation arose, what happened there, for those that weren't following, was Miss O'Brien was wearing a Fitbit and the family had submitted some of this data to the Mass Casualty Commission. But if you read through the foundational document itself, or listened to the presentation from uh, commission lawyer Roger Burrell, you wouldn't really understand that there was anything significant about those uh, documents or about that Fitbit data. And so what happened was that the family, after the day was done, the presentation was made, they came out and made a, a public statement saying, well, we've provided this Fitbit data it seems to show that uh, Miss O'Brien was alive for some hours after she was uh, thought to be deceased by the police and, you know, have provided that to the commission and it wasn't included in the, in the uh, presentation. So certainly that was, uh, that was an unusual choice, a uh, controversial choice and I think uh, an improper choice by the uh, Mass Casualty Commission not to include that. And what happens is you know, you have these presentations on a certain day, and then, you know, sometimes a few days or maybe a week later, uh, people, the other parties have a chance to say, well, here are some things, some questions we'd like to ask, some witnesses we would like to have brought forth to talk about that document. But by the time the witnesses actually appear, some uh, time has passed, some weeks have passed, and the original narrative presented by the Mass Casualty Commission has settled in people's minds. And, uh, you know, at that point, it's more difficult to get back and, and reset the uh, the narrative. And now, in fact, the Mass Casualty Commission is making that more difficult for citizens or, well, family members would already have all of these documents through their counsel. But for the general public to see a presentation and then click through to the source documents and see, okay, is that really what those documents revealed? That's going to be made more difficult now because the Mass Casualty Commission has said they're going to hold those documents now for two days after the presentations are made in order to check them for accuracy or I guess see what controversies come up and see if they can get ahead of it. It's not certainly to serve the public uh, interest, it's to serve vested interests or their own interests. So. I want to talk about those. Uh, I know the lawyers must be frustrated with this method of presentation. I know, you know, when you, as a lawyer, a defense lawyer, if you, the Crown is making their, you know, asking their questions of a witness, well, you know, in a matter of minutes, you're going to get your chance to ask questions and, you know, correct the narrative in the mind of the judge or the jury or whoever's listening to it. But now lawyers are being forced to wait uh, days and sometimes weeks before they can get back and ask questions of, uh, of a particular witness and of a particular element of the narrative. Now, I have st stated this before, some of the documents and some of the statements that are uh, in the source documents tend to reveal a little too much. Uh, two examples, I know, um, you know, reading through some of the statements of the people that lived in port -Pic, they were talking about, you know, friendships, relationships, and other sort of personal details that really weren't relevant to the issues, uh, but were included for everybody to read. The other is uh, some of these officer statements uh, when they're asked about their, their mental health status, uh, that sort of thing. 
in a way it's important for people to see and hear that but I suspect from the officers perspective uh, they'd rather if those were redacted or or you know give them an opportunity to talk about that themselves in public as a, a witness in the manner that they would wish rather than just having their statements uh, plastered over the internet for everybody to read um, now they do the mass casualty commission that is they do redact you know personal details phone numbers addresses these sorts of things as well as uh, details that I think they consider to be too uh, graphic or, or gruesome to have uh, revealed so I guess the first thing when you're looking at a set of documents is to say well what's not here you know if there's a an officer involved who hasn't given a statement a witness involved who hasn't given a statement uh, that's automatically suspicious uh, some you know any, any item that hasn't been checked you see all right have they done fingerprint analysis have they done DNA analysis anything that hasn't happened uh, that's uh, one of the first questions is why it hasn't happened you know for example in the Miss O'Brien's situation there were two uh, follow-up officer reports which two years later haven't been uh, obtained so those are the kinds of things you watch for um, you know if when you read through the foundational documents just to say uh, tell you the structure you know, these foundational documents are you know uh, sometimes 20 30 pages long but they'll have footnotes and reference other uh, source documents so you can click on those and you get to the person's statement or their report or, or whatever document but in some cases the links weren't active so for example the Fitbit data wasn't there there was nothing uh, nothing to show that and there was uh, a couple of other officer reports which were also not uh, noted to be not available or some links that weren't uh, active that were the, the documents were taken down for a few days so anything like that is something you watch for a great source of information uh, well, you have to watch for it uh, and read it carefully are the are typed notes from officers any officer report of course you're going to want to read so there's two versions of this there's the handwritten version which every officer carries a notepad with them at all times and they're taking notes as the investigation unfolds but then after the fact they take those notes and then they'll type up a version of you know what they did during a certain incident well you have to recognize that if you're reading the typed version which of course is usually easier to read you're getting an after the fact uh, version where the officer now knows what a little more at least of the full story involved and so sometimes they can you know tailor their typed report to fit that narrative or fit whatever they think they need to uh, you know say or exclude now anytime you have an officer statement and you have multiple officers involved in a certain uh, scene you want to compare and contrast and see if there's any daylight uh, between those statements and as I said handwritten notes are usually more contemporaneous with the you know the situation that they're describing but not always so you know if in a situation such as this for example where you know the, things are happening and there's a lot of quick moving parts uh, active shooter where everybody's eyes are you know looking around to to see uh, what may be behind behind a barrier or behind when it, anything officers of course are not making notes right then they're gonna do it a little bit after the fact so that's always something you have to think of is these are notes that are being made not at, at the time but afterwards then uh, so for more accurate contemporaneous uh, details a good source in this case and some others you get is the radio traffic so you get transcript of everything that was discussed over the radio broadcast in this case there were several uh, channels being used one by the emergency response team one by regular uh, members and so you have to look to all of those and see all right what were people saying at the time and what were um, you know what did people seem to know what details were being made available over the radio that other people could access now this is uh, an interesting th element of this by the way as I read through uh, much of the radio broadcast transcript I was looking for cases where officers were saying they couldn't get through because as we saw in the cert report of the Onslow Belmont fire hall shooting there was some allegations that 
members were being, they call it, bonged out. So if you try to hit your radio to speak, well, if somebody else is already on the channel, then you couldn't get through. you get bonged out. And so that's what I know officers Melanson and Brown were talking about when they said they were trying to get on the radio and see, is that an officer or is that the, the gunman at the fire hall? Uh, if, if you believe that side of the narrative. So, but when I read through the radio broadcasts, you know, I was expecting to see a whole bunch of these comments of, sorry, I couldn't get through before, or just, you know, I tried to get through a minute ago, here's what you need to know. But none of that happens. Uh, I haven't seen any of those comments to suggest there were significant communication issues in that regard. Now, people may have just not said so, and they tried to get through. I know there was a reference in Natasha Jameson's statement that when there's a situation like this, you try to leave the channel open so that the first responding members have better access to it. But uh, again, it wasn't a reference to them actually at the time uh, not being able to access the channel. So uh, that was uh, that was certainly an interesting element of that. Now, uh, you have interviews with officers as well, in addition to whatever report they've done. In this case, the Mass Casualty Commission has also interviewed each officer. So when you read those reports, uh, those interviews, some of the things I watch for are how uh, how are their answers? Are they long answers or short answers? Longer answers tend to be people that are remembering things and they're just trying to describe as much detail as they can. Shorter answers tend to be people that don't want to say very much and are just trying to get away with saying as little as possible and still appear to be answering the question. So are they detailed in their answers or are they sparse? Are they vague or are they specific? All of these interviews reveal something about the mindset of the officer at the time. Even though they're done after the fact, they can, you know, if they're being honest in their answers, they can reveal, all right, well, were they nervous at the time? Were they uh, stoic and steady? Uh, you know, what kind of approach did the officer in particular have? Now, you also have to realize when you're reading these interviews that these officers have had a chance to prepare their answers uh, or to re review things in advance. You know, they've done preparation interviews before the recorded interviews. So that's something to, to be aware of. Getting back to Miss Jameson, uh, Officer Jameson's uh, statement, uh, she was interviewed and she said she did have a chance to, uh, you know, prepare her and uh, prepare for the interview. Uh, certainly, uh, there was some allegations about Miss uh, Jameson, Officer Jameson, about you know whether she in fact had maybe gone into Portapique and not just waited at the the end of the road, and whether she may have been involved in the. Uh, uh, the Corey Ellison uh, uh, situation. Now there's some allegations or some suggestions about that. So I was reading Miss Jameson's interview to see, well, is there any possibility of this? Uh, now when I read hers, uh, her first talk about is, uh, first thing she talks about is how her experience, and she's had lots of tough experience in the human trafficking uh, world where she's a, a subject matter expert. Um, she's had mental health support uh, since uh, the port pick situation, so um, you know, I know that was part of the situation. Or part of the concern is, well, if she's had all this mental health support after the fact, perhaps there was something more to her involvement that uh, you know that we're just not hearing about yet. Uh, in in her interview, she talks how she's IR trained, so trained the same as uh, constables Baselt, uh, Patton, and uh, and Merchant to go in. But, you know, she said she was standing uh, at the head of the road with uh, Constables Colford and Grund and then another unknown officer. So that seemed kind of key to me. There was an unknown to her uh, officer there with her. And so it seemed unlikely to that somebody with an unknown person in the scene would feel comfortable just sort of making things up and, uh, you know, trying to cover things up after the fact. So... Uh, those are those are the kinds of things I watch for when I'm reading uh, an interview with a, a police officer. Now, civilians uh, civilians give lots of interviews as well. Those are different. When you're reading a civilian interview, I tend to, you know, both sides have a plan going in, and the early answers those tend to be what the civilian witness wants to say. 
you know, you can ask them whatever they want early on. We saw this with uh, Deborah Tebow when she was being interviewed. You know, you ask her a question, you could tell she has something she wants to say and she's going to say it early on. Whereas later in the interview, you get to the questions, the answers that the questioner wants answered. So the things the questioner wants to know, all right, they'll, they'll let you give your answers and talk and talk and talk. But as they get to the end of the interview, there's particular facts that they're trying to get out of you or out of the witness. And so that's when, you know, you get, get a sense of what their plan was going in. So that's an interesting little dynamic when you're reading uh, civilian interviews. Another thing you look for, and these are available in the uh, source documents, are training manuals or any uh, records of uh, training received by officers. So you check those training manuals and you say, all right, well, if this is the, you know, the this is the, how you're supposed to do a certain thing, well, is that what in fact they did? And so you compare their actions during the situation to the training uh, that they were supposedly received. Uh, and if those two match up, and if they don't, uh, then you ask why they did it uh, a different way. Another thing that are, is a, a good source of information are uh, EHS, uh, ambulance notes, and medical files. Now, witnesses will often, or sometimes at least, say things to an ambulance driver or a doctor that they're not going to say to a police officer. And, you know, there are different ways you're allowed to or not allowed to use those in a criminal case, but certainly in an inquiry, uh, you know, these, these are all fair, fair to be used. So you watch for uh, what kinds of things did they say to an ambulance driver, what's in the medical records. I know in particular in this case uh, Miss Banfield's medical situation is at issue. Uh, her medical records have not really been disclosed. It's unusual for medical records to be disclosed widely to the public, but uh, it does happen. Uh, so that's something I was uh, looking for is to see what kind of uh, medical evidence. Now I noticed in the EHS uh, records uh, didn't really say too much about uh, Miss Banfield's condition, uh, so we'll have to see if there are more documents in that nature become available. Now, uh, another thing you get are these what are called police uh, in identification reports, ident uh, reports. I know uh, what is a document? Uh, I think twenty seven forty. I wrote down is uh, is one example. Now these are what you get an exhibit officer. So not the investigating officer, not the first one on the scene, but somebody, that, an officer that comes later and just says, okay, what was found and where was it found? And they just photograph and document every single thing. And this person is usually not an investigator or not the investigator on the file. And so they just list everything that they find. Uh, sometimes it can be out of context, so you have to review it a little more detail. but you know, you, it's valuable information. So if somebody says, well, I threw a jacket into the woods as I ran away, well, okay, was a jacket found? Uh, you know, the, the issue, one of the issues in this case is uh, these handcuffs. You know, Ms. Banfield says she was put in handcuffs. Where are they? Where are the handcuffs been found? I uh, haven't uh, seen that anywhere. One thing I did notice, though, when at the final, uh, when they, they found uh, Wartman's uh, duty belt, the duty belt he was wearing, the uh, handcuffs were missing, but the key was the key was there, but the handcuffs slot was empty. Now that's not to say that he had a pair of handcuffs that weren't there; they weren't found. That's all. Uh, so, you know, the burned police car. You check to see at our eight was the silent patrolman there. Was it uh, real? Uh, the same as a regular police car? Could it have been broken? What condition was it in? Could somebody have crawled through it? Those are the kinds of things you look for. You know, in the scene from uh, from Ventura Drive, from the you know where he stayed overnight, there was a a pair of size eight slippers that seems like they're too small for uh, Wartman himself. So, what were those doing in the police car? It might be more Miss Banfield's size. So lots of things that you know. So you can get these ident reports, and you say, all right, what was what was that thing doing there? Uh, you know, just uh, you look through those reports and look for things that don't seem to don't seem to fit uh, literally uh, there's other documents there's post-mortem documents on all the victims um, 
In these cases, uh, the, the medical examiner can will sometimes see entry and exit wounds on bullets, and so you can see yeah, all right, how, the, how the person may have been situated when they were shot. Uh, may not be a lot of, may not be a, all that material in this case, but in some cases it certainly is. So there's a lot of different kinds of documents, as, uh, as you can see as we go through these, and there may be more different kinds outlined, but I guess I just wanted to give you a sense because uh, I know now that now that we've seen how the Mass Casualty Commission will put a narrative out there but then you know have it questioned uh, directly by the other documents uh, just hours later so I think the the citizens and those watching this and the participants really need to you know check the source documents and I just wanted to give you a sense of uh, as a lawyer how a person uh, how, how you'd go through doing that so uh, this is uh, we're up over 20 minutes now as a video. That's uh, usually longer than I usually go, but there's a lot of different kinds of documents. So I uh, hope you found that uh, useful to, uh, you know, get that kind of guidance as you go through these documents yourself, and as other uh, things arise. So we'll be back watching on uh, April 11th as we go through the fire hall incident and the details there. Uh, you can check my piece on that. I did a I had some questions about the CERT report that was um, released last year on this and a lot of questions involved in that so we'll be watching for that on Monday and I'll have a, a summary of the day's proceedings after that takes place so until then uh, thanks for watching uh, don't forget to like and subscribe share it with a friend all those good things and we will see you next time